There's no reason to believe that Christians are dumb. It's Christians who started Harvard and Princeton and yeah, all these schools. It's, it's Christians that have traditionally been the ones that have built up the scientific method in the first place. Why? Because Christians believe that God was ordered and therefore that the universe and the world would be ordered. Therefore, we could experiment on it and expect to get similar results. Therefore, we could get some knowledge through science. That's a Christian mindset. As you can tell, Today's episode is going to give us some important answers about the truth of the Christian faith. Here's Pastor David. Right, we got different tools. Right? Law enforcement has an investigative way of discovering. Science has a way to investigate and discover evidence. History does. You know, the, in the law, we have ways of what we do. Okay, all, all, all of these things are ways and tools. Okay? They're all tools. They're methods. They help us arrive at conclusions for the things that we then believe are true. We gather enough evidence, right? We come to a conclusion. Unfortunately, there are still a number of people propagating the belief that the only way we can know anything is through the scientific method. The only problem with that is we can't use the scientific method to prove the scientific method. So I guess we don't know that only the scientific method can be proved. But that's a whole side thing. I, don't, I won't even take the easy shots, okay? I mean, I know I just did, but... There are a number of people who believe that. This would have been like the Francis Collins, Dr. Francis Collins, earlier in his life. Only the scientific method, right? So for the question, the answer to the question, how do people know the things that they believe are true? Francis Collins would have said the scientific method. That's how they know. That's how they know. If something can be proven through the scientific method, then it can be proven true. If it can't be proven through the scientific method, then it cannot be proven true, and we cannot know it. And there are so many problems with that with that statement, the first of which I've already mentioned, right? The statement itself cannot be proven through the scientific method. So it sort of self-defeats. But there are further problems. One of the things is this belief leads to scientific atheism, but not because it proves scientific atheism. It's because it assumes atheism. It assumes atheism because it limits the group of things which we can know to truthfully exist to only those things which can be repeated and measured in certain kinds of scientific experiments. And therefore, everything else is just not knowledge. It's just not real. So the philosophy assumes all kinds of things like atheism and like there's no purpose in life. It assumes a philosophy called hard determinism. Scientific atheists have to hold to a philosophy called hard determinism. It is a necessary component of scientific atheism. Okay, and hard determinism is basically, in other words, it's basically uh, their... There is no God, and then therefore, all the things that happen and all the things that exist and all the things that go on are things that happen by chance, and all those things were determined to happen. They couldn't have happened any other way. In other words, nothing that happens, including the thoughts that you think in your head, have happened for any reason other than the fact that they were going to happen and they're happening by chance. You have no control over them. Any sense of control that you feel about your life is an absolute illusion. Now, this puts the scientific atheist in a bit of a bind because if you can only think what you are predetermined to think, then you have no reason to believe that anything you think is actually true. Right? Charles Darwin called a version of this problem his horrid doubt. He says, but then with me, the horrid doubt always arises, whether the convictions of a man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? British geneticist and evolutionary biologist J.B.S. Haldane makes the problem clear as well. This is what he says. For if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. Because they've been determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. You see the problem here? If you believe in scientism, that science is the only way to discover any truth, the problem is that it includes... Besides the fact that it doesn't make any sense as a philosophical statement, but the problem is that that, that that includes the belief, the necessary belief that you only believe that it's true because you were determined to believe that it's true and that therefore you can't depend on the fact that you believe that it's true. And so you get into this very vicious cycle that can really keep you up at night. It really could. 
And it really has kept a lot of people up at night, including probably Dr. Francis Collins that we talked about earlier. So how do we know, how do people know that the things that they believe are true? The answer cannot be only by using science. It cannot be that. For the, that answer is grossly insufficient for the task of answering the real questions that we care about, as Dr. Francis Collins discovered that we talked about earlier. But it also contradicts itself and leads to absurdities, like the ones we just talked about, not being able to trust your own mind about anything that you believe at that point. As agnostic uh, professor from Harvard, Stephen Jay Gould said, he said, to say it for all my colleagues and for the umpteenth million time, science simply cannot by its legitimate methods, adjudicate the issue of God's possible superintendence of nature. We neither affirm it, we either neither affirm nor deny it. We simply can't comment on it as scientists. People have come to the point of realizing that science is not sufficient to completely answer all the questions that are out there. Now, I don't agree completely with Professor Gould, who passed away, I think, back in 2002. Um, I would agree that science, by its legitimate methods, cannot disprove the existence of God, but that's because, not because I think scientific method is completely inadequate to know anything about God, but rather that all of the legitimate scientific discoveries that we've seen, especially in the recent past in physics and other areas, uh, are actually bringing more and more and more and more evidence that God does exist to play, not that he doesn't. That's, that's more the issue for me, which is why we're seeing a surge of theists, that's people who believe in the existence of God, theists. We're seeing a surge of theists, and we have for the last really quarter of a decade, 25 years or so, in the philosophy and science departments of major universities. They're growing. There was a time when atheism was the only show in town, and we're actually seeing a growth in the number of believers that are teaching science, social sciences, and hard sciences like physics and chemistry and so on, math. The truth is that logical, reasonable arguments for the existence, existence of God have become more and more sophisticated. Probably the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Alvin Plantinga, is a believer and has, and has done amazing work in incredibly complex and sophisticated arguments for the existence of God. And people have more and more and more been rejecting scientism, modernistic, atheistic scientism as a way of knowing things. Okay, uh, to even say that the scientific method is a main way of knowing things as opposed to a tool in our, in our, on our tool belt to try to figure out what's true. Okay, here's, here's the answer now. I'll give you the answer to this question I've asked tons of times now. How do we know that the things we know are true? How do we know that things are true? How do we know that they are? It is the inner working of faith and reason. Now let me explain that. Christians, atheists, whatever you are, Everybody has faith. You all have faith. Nobody walked in here today and has no faith, okay? And, and, and here's what I mean. It takes some level of faith to believe any truth proposition. You believe that the chair that you're sitting in right now is not all of a sudden going to collapse, right? I hope you believe that. You believe that as you're sitting there, it's going to continue to hold you up. But you have to believe that at some level by faith because one of these chairs I took all the screws out of. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do it. I didn't do that. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. No. No, you're good. You're good. Your faith, but you were starting to lose your faith, uh, at least in that, right? If, if, if you are sitting in the chair, if you're driving a car, you're believing that it's not just going to all of a sudden go crazy and, and pull off the side of the road without you moving it, right? You have faith that your car is going to work the way that it's supposed to, Right? You have faith that when your teacher told you that George Washington was the first president of the United States, that she was telling you the truth. You have a certain level of faith because you weren't there. Well, some of you maybe, but most of you were not there at that time, right? You have faith that today this sermon is going to get over in time for you to watch football. <laughs> Whether your faith is well-placed, we will find out. Every belief you hold requires some level of faith. You have a faith position. There are elements of faith and hopefully reason in every belief that you have. This applies to scientific beliefs as much as, it believes, as, much as moral beliefs or beliefs about God or any other metaphysical right things out there, 
what you believe about love, justice, truth, and what you believe about when water boils, they're all going to have some aspect of faith and some aspect of reason, right? That's how it works. Faith and reason work together to help us know what's true. How do we know what's true? Faith and reason working together. That's how we know what comports with reality. We use reason, logic, and evidence to get us to a certain point. We gather the evidence. We investigate the truth. We get us to this place where we're pretty sure, really sure, beyond a reasonable doubt. We get somewhere. And then from that spot, the next step that goes from there to knowledge is in step of faith for everybody. It's not, this is not unique to Christians or to atheists or to anybody else. We have reason that can take us to a certain point, and then faith has to take us across the threshold. That's how it works. Faith, faith is the thing, is that step that we make, the thing that we do that we can't see based on all the things that we can see. Right? We can see many things, and we take all that evidence. Faith is that step, the part that we can't see, the part that's left. So when we work through the issues that Lord willing will be working through in the next weeks, the question for the skeptic is not, do I have faith? You're sitting in that chair hoping that I didn't take the screws out of it, okay? You have faith. You have faith about a million things. There, there is no, <laughs> there is any, sci- any real scientist will tell you that there is nothing in the realm of science that has been proven completely. And it's not even in the nature of science to try to, to try to do that task, to prove something that would require zero faith. There's no such thing. You already have faith with every belief that you have. Now, the question is, which worldview, which worldview has the best reasons behind it? Which worldview has the best reasons to believe that it's true? Is it atheism or agnosticism? Or do the truth claims made by Christianity take actually less faith, less faith than believing those other things? That's the question you need to ask yourself. That's what you got to walk through. When you line up the evidence, all of it, not this little piece here, not I'm going on Reddit and I'm in my pajamas, mom, make me a sandwich, and you're doing it. But the real, the real evidence, the real stuff, all of it, comprehensively, and you put it together, which one of these truth claims makes more sense of the world? Atheism, agnosticism, Buddhism, Islam. I mean, there's a million out there. It's a whole marketplace. Christians, which one requires the smallest step from evidence to knowledge? And it's our contention that Christianity takes the smallest step. But it's the contention of many that Christianity is nonsense or that Christianity is something that only dumb people believe. We're going to talk about whether Christianity is just a psychological crutch, Lord willing, later on. That's kind of what the zeitgeist, that's kind of what the, where, where things have been moving. But there's no warrant, there's no reason to believe that Christians are dumb. It's Christians who started Harvard and Princeton and yeah, all these schools. It's, it's Christians that have traditionally been the ones that have built up the scientific method in the first place. Why? Because Christians believe that God was ordered and therefore that the universe and the world would be ordered. Therefore, we could experiment on it and expect to get similar results. Therefore, we could get some knowledge through science. That's a Christian mindset. Okay? So I just want you to be clear about that. I want you to be clear both about the fact that 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 story, Christians, dumb, atheists, smart, is an untrue story. It's, it's, It's the kind of thing that people do when they're trying to make an argument, and they don't have a good argument. It's ridicule. That's all it is. It's ridicule. There's a guy, um, David Berlinski, he, he doesn't claim to be a Christian. Actually, he describes himself as a secular Jew. He comments on the philosophy of so many atheists and sort of what they've tried to say is true. Lately, and he says this, has anyone provided proof of God's inexistence? Has anyone provided proof that God doesn't exist? Not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe or why it is here? Not even close. Have our sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe in anything so long as it is not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good 
not even close to being close. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy in the sciences? Close enough. Does anything in the sciences or their philosophy justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Irrational. Not even in the ballpark. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt? Dead on. Maybe there's something to what David Berlinski is saying here. Maybe. People have been more and more realizing and understanding the interplay between faith and reason, both in the physical and the social sciences. As time has gone on, these people who are the ones who are trying to discover truths, they've more and more been understanding and working through the interplay between faith and reason, which is why we see so many more in the sciences these days. The philosophies and arguments that were supposedly proving that God does not exist have been consistently disproven or shown to be faulty, and the arguments for the existence of God have become more and more sophisticated and convincing. It is now reported that two-thirds of scientists and universities are, they believe in God. Two-thirds. Two-thirds of scientists and universities now believe in God. That's not a made-up statistic like my wife's class. That's real. How is it possible when Time Magazine told us so long ago that God was dead, That he's so alive, not only in churches, but in universities, in science, in politics, in in every aspect of life, everywhere you go. Why is it that belief in God is still incredibly strong? Because we're all idiots? No. Even one of the foremost atheist philosophers of the 20th century, a guy that I used to read when I was in, when I was uh, studying philosophy, a guy named Anthony Flew a few years ago, went from being this incredibly powerful arguer for atheism to being a theist, a believer in God. The fact is that the evidence that really, really, really smart people who have spent a really, really, really long time thinking about these things, more and more are coming around to the idea that God is real, not that he's fake, not that he's not real. That's the fact. For 2,000 years, it's been trying to be pushed out of existence that Christianity is true, and yet it's still incredibly strong. The evidence is strong. There is plenty here for the skeptic to sink his or her teeth into. And here's the thing. The thing that's really cool about Christianity in this thing, in in the way that we're working, is that Christianity is about facts. It's about actual real historical facts. So it can actually be judged, not just on some ethereal spiritual thing, but you can actually judge Christianity on whether a certain historical fact took place. The whole thing, the entire play turns on one act, right? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The claim that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Christianity rises or falls on it. If it happened, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Christianity is certainly true. People don't rise from the dead. So if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Christianity is certainly true. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, Christianity is certainly false. Certainly false. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 19 says this. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. What's he saying? Your faith, that step you took, was not based on good evidence. If Christ is not risen. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. When we did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If we only have a hope in Christ, a Christ that died and did not rise again, we are the most pitiable people on the face of the planet. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, we are wasting our time here. See, I, here's the deal. Some of you may think this, but we're actually not here because we couldn't think of anything better to do on a Sunday morning. It's not why we're here. Well, it's raining. I guess I'll go to a church. That's not, that's not why we're here. It's not why we're here. We're here because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And that is a fact that you can know through faith and reason as much as you know anything. It may be one of the most attacked historical facts in, in existence because the whole play turns on that one act. And yet in 2,000 years, they have not disproved that Jesus rose again. They have not produced a body. They have not convinced the philosophers. They have not convinced the scientists. 
I know that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose from the dead based on the same kind of evidence, the same kind of logic and reason that makes me believe that Abraham Lincoln lived. It's the same kind of historical inquiry that I can do to know that Abraham Lincoln lived. I can do that same kind of historical inquiry to know whether Jesus lived, whether he died, and whether he rose again. The same kind of inquiry. It's a historical fact. And here's the deal. I know it's true, and it transformed my life. It's not, Abraham Lincoln didn't transform my life. But because of Jesus Christ, I have life, and I'm new in him. Ultimately, that's what this series is about, because it's always going to be about Jesus. That Jesus Christ rose from the dead, verifying that he is the truth, and that he can and will change and transform you from death to life. Ultimately, that's what I want you to know. But I'm willing to do the work to prove it. I'm willing to do the work to talk about the things that are difficult. But ultimately, what I want you to know is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that the power of his resurrection is still at work, that his Holy Spirit is here and still at work and can change your life. So have you realized that you've been betting your life on the wrong information? Or have the things you've heard made you question some of your beliefs and you want to know more? Call us at 360-885-9000 or send us an email. Use info at axchurchnw.org. And even better, come see us this Sunday morning. Get all the info you need anytime at axchurchnw.org. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll check out our next episode for more with Pastor David Robinson here on Contemplate.